We are wrapping up our series, In the Spirit. Um, and so this morning, the way we're going to do is we're going to do a quick review, and then we're going to tie everything together in one nice big culmination of the series. Um, because everything that we've talked about has been impactful and meaningful for us as individuals, but it's also amplified when we exercise these things in community. And we're going to see how Paul closes chapter 4 of Ephesians with this, how this all comes together and how it's going to impact us as a church and how, by extension, how the church is going to impact the community that God has placed us in. But quick review for everyone who maybe has missed the first four parts of the series. Um, we started by talking about how in unity. In Ephesians 4, 3, it talked about how we are to be eager to maintain the unity in the Spirit through the bond of peace, and how Jesus said that those blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons and daughters of God. We are to hunger for unity. We're to fight for unity in our families, in our church. We're to be eager to make sure that nothing compromises the unity that God has brought into our church body and our lives by extension. On Mother's Day, we talked about maturity and how we as a community and as a group are to encourage one another in our spiritual growth because Paul warned us that if we stay children in our faith, we will be tossed to and fro like waves by the lies and the deceptions of the world. So we grow in spiritual maturity to protect our hearts, protect our minds, and by extension, we protect our friends and our families because we can discern what is of God, what is true, and what is good, and what is contrary to God's teaching and God's will. <clears throat> With us next week, two weeks ago, we had the Set Free Retreat, which a couple of you participated in, and we followed up by talking about how we are made new in the Spirit. We are new creations in Christ, and because of that newness, we're to cut all ties off from the old self. We're to look nothing like our lives prior to coming to know Jesus. We are made new, and as part of the newness, we are free from the bondages of sin. We're free from the bondages of the old life. We are renewed and made clean so freedom in the Spirit. And last week we talked about how power, we need the Holy Spirit's power, how knowledge is not enough. Because if knowledge was enough, then the North American church should be the most effective church ever in all of history. And the reality is we're not. Less than 1% of Canadians attend a church on a regular basis. We need something more than just knowledge. We need we need God's power. We need God's gifting. We need, we need something more than just head knowledge. And so before we get into it too much further, uh, I want to ask what part of this series stood out to you so far? As we wrap up, as you're sitting there listening online, listening in-house, in Redverse and in Carlisle, which of these series is kind of like you walked away, you had to think a little bit harder? You're like, hmm, I got to ponder that one a little bit more, or that one just kind of hit a little bit closer to home, or, and maybe it wasn't the whole message, maybe it was just something that was said, or a Bible verse that was quoted, just what was it, what was one part? I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say like the whole series was awesome, I think the whole series was awesome, um, and I think it was perfectly timed with everything that's going on, especially as we prepare you know, we got some good news about restrictions, but I'm not saying anything more because, you know, I'm not holding my breath. Um, that could change, but the light is at the end of the tunnel. Hopefully we can go restriction-free sooner rather than later. Um, but that's all I'm going to say. <clears throat> the worship team's getting anxious. They want to get going again, so, and I don't blame them. Um, but I think the timing of this series, along with what we're going to talk about next month, uh, is just good prep, good reminders as we get ready for this new season, this new chapter of the church that God is leading us into. <clears throat> well, we're going to dive into, uh, if you're not there yet, we're at Ephesians 4, starting at verse 25. Um, if you've got your paper Bible, you can turn there. As you said, we've kind of been working through Ephesians 4 through this whole series, picking out the different parts that Paul wants to highlight for not only the Ephesian church, but for us as well. Um, so yeah, we're going to dive right into the passage. Starting at verse 25, Therefore, put away falsehood. 
Let each, one of, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. <clears throat> now, as we went through that, uh, brings me to my second question, and I ask this every week, which point in Paul's list stood out to you? As we went through that list, and we went through all the things that Paul wanted to bring up, what in that list stood out to you? Now, I ask that every week, and it seems like, it might seem like a cop-out. Um, oh, what's going on here? But it's not. This is a question that we should be asking ourselves every single time we sit down to read God's Word. Because then we are more attentive. I don't know about you, but there have been times where I sit down to read God's Word, and I read two or three chapters, and I close the Bible, and I'm like, okay, eh, what did I just read? I am not remembering a single detail of everything that just came out. But when I'm reading and I'm asking that question, what is standing out? God, what do you want to lay on my heart? This is a skill that is going to be important because one of the things that came up over the course of the restrictions and over the course of the lockdown was not just, okay, we lost the building for a bit, right? We couldn't gather. We couldn't come together and hear God's word preached by the pastor for a little bit. But what happened if we lost Facebook? And what happened if we lost YouTube? And there's absolutely no way for me to do what I'm doing right now. Would our faith survive? Would the church survive? What are the skills that you guys need as the church, whether you're here or online, so that if that day ever comes, and Bible says there's persecution coming, if that day were to come and we lose all of our platforms, would your faith survive? Would the church survive? And that's a question we've got to ask ourselves, and it's actually a question we're going to be talking about come June. Um, yeah, that's a little tidbit for what's coming in the June series. We're just going to be looking at what are these disciplines that we need in order to survive, because if we ever did lose everything, if we ever did have to self-feed as the new word is, that's being thrown around, could we do it? Could we sustain our faith, sustain our life in Christ until we got all of those privileges back. Um, so yeah, that's my little tidbit. Tune in for June. It's going to be good. Um, but we're going to go through each verse in the end of verse in Ephesians 4. So we're going to read the verse. We're going to park on it for a little bit, bring something out, and at the end, we're just going to, like I said, we're going to tie it all together. So Ephesians 4, starting at verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his, with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Now, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, um, speaking the truth, we don't, probably don't speak the truth all the time, right? With the, every once in a while, we kind of slip in a little white lie, and we, we have all the best intentions for slipping in that little white lie, right? We, whatever the motivation is, but Paul is saying, no, 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 let no falsehood, let no lies, let no deception be on you. Let us only speak the truth. And maybe you're sitting there like, well, if I speak the truth all the time, people aren't going to like me. It's not the truth that's the problem. It's probably the way you delivered it. Because when we read through the Gospels, Jesus never lied. Jesus never lied to anyone. He never stretched the truth. He never did it. And he had thousands of people like him and follow him and hang on his every word. We can be 100% truthful all the time and people can still like us. I think this is why the Apostle John starts the Gospel of John by saying 
that Jesus spoke the truth, spoke truth and grace. It's not just about, because sometimes, let's be honest, we, we, when we have to speak the truth, we sit down with somebody, okay, I got to be honest with you. And nothing good comes from that. If someone sits down with me like, Pastor Matt, I got to be honest with you, I brace for impact because nothing good follows that line. But I, we should get to the point where something good does happen, follow that, right? I got to be honest with you, whatever it is. And so often the white lie is, oh, I'm good. How are you doing? Oh, I'm good. Oh, things are great. Meanwhile, everything is falling apart. Part of being truthful, part of being honest with one another is being vulnerable enough to invite people into the struggle, invite people into the pain. Imagine what it would be like if all of us were always honest, always being like, oh, the support, the, the community, the, the camaraderie, because we could come alongside. We want to help each other, I think, but we don't invite ourselves we don't invite people into the hurt we don't invite people into the struggle and so we struggle alone and so often the struggle doesn't go our way be honest with one another let no falsehood nothing and that one alone is probably being like okay i got my point for the day i'm done um that one yeah anyways we got more to go <laughs> strap in it's gonna be good i promise ephesians Chapter, verse 26, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Now, this is interesting. Paul is making an allowance for us to be angry. He's like, you know what? I'm living life right along with you guys. I have, there's times where I get angry. And there are situations that we can be angry about, right? There are, there's, we should be angry about injustice. We should be angry about the atrocities that we're reading about overseas or wherever. We should be angry about sin. We should be angry about certain things. But what Paul is talking about is when somebody does something that makes you mad, it is okay to be mad about the action, but if we hold on to it, we're not mad about the action anymore. We're mad at the person. And when we get mad at the person, then unforgiveness and bitterness start to well up within us, and that's what we're not supposed to let the sun go down on. We're not supposed to let unforgiveness and bitterness well up in our hearts and well up, because as I've heard you, I'm sure you've heard it said lots of times, bitterness and unforgiveness is like drinking poison, hoping it's going to hurt the other person. The more you hold on to it, the more we refuse to forgive the wrong, the more it hurts you. Because most of the time, the other person doesn't even know that they wronged you. Or they've done it and they've moved it on. So your unforgiveness and your bitterness isn't affecting them at all. But it's hurting you. Do, it's okay to get angry. It's okay to be upset in that moment. But don't let the sun go down on your anger. Verse 28, and give no opportunity to the devil. Now, this one was kind of interesting. I'm going to, a little bit of sharing. Um, a, about a week and a half ago, I started doing um, a, a men's health thing. And it wasn't just physical health. It was spiritual health. It's, it's emotional health. It's the whole total package. I've been trying to figure out something that's going to work good for me because I've tried lots, they don't work. But this seems to be working. And part of it was you had to, you know, there's certain fasting times, there's certain times they can't eat certain foods. Um, but there's, it's supposed to be 90 days. And for 90 days, I'm not supposed to look at my phone unless I'm calling you guys, texting, or posting something on Faith Life. Anything that's unnecessary, gone. Absolutely no movies. Absolutely. Computer, same thing. Only what is necessary for work, only what is necessary for life, everything else, gone. No video games, nothing. That screen time was, it's been tough, let's be honest, because the screens are everywhere. But I gotta say that so many things that, we, that I find that I struggle with, so many temptations that seem to like flood my life, I have not noticed them at all since I cut out those screens, since I stopped watching the shows. And I don't watch, like, 
gross stuff. I don't watch, anyways. But it's, it's so, like, accepted in our world that it just, it's in everything. It seeps into everything. And so when you cut that off, I feel great. And this is what Paul is talking about. It's not like he's saying, don't give the devil opportunity to tempt you back into your old way. Don't give the devil opportunity to tempt you into sin. Jesus taught us to pray, and he closes it by saying, deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us, Lord, from the evil one. And yet, so often, we flirt with sin. We get so close, and we're like, oh, I'm kind of tempted, but I'm not going to, I won't cross that line. Famous last words. Give the devil no opportunity. Flee from every immorality. Flee from even the hint. Paul actually told this to Timothy. Let not even a hint of immorality be in your life. Flee from it. Give the devil no opportunity to get in and disrupt your life. And I gotta say, the whole no screen thing is a big help. But maybe that's a help for me. Maybe for you it's something else. Maybe, I don't know, I could list off, but I won't. I let the Holy Spirit deal with that. But whatever it is for you, identify those weak spots. Identify those things where the devil has tempted you in the past and just cut it off. Run away from it. Give him no opportunity to get in there and disrupt the good things the Spirit is trying to accomplish in your life. Uh, verse 28, let the thief no longer steal, but, let, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Now, the interesting thing about this, I, the first part we can all get behind, right? Thieves, stop stealing. Okay, good. We're good there. And then we got, I think sometimes we just kind of brush over the next part, like stop stealing, do honest work. Good man, you are now contributing to society. We, we approve of this. But what does Paul say? He doesn't say do honest work and provide for your family's needs. He doesn't say do honest work and provide for your own personal needs. He says do honest work so that you can give to those who are in need, aka exercise generosity. And this is something that I think we can all be reminded of, that it is not enough to provide for ourselves or set up, you know, the nest egg or make sure there's an inheritance for the kids, but God calls us continually to be generous because there's so many people in need. There's so many times in life and in church where people are hurting. And again, back to this honesty thing. If we're honest with ourselves, like, oh, you know, who things are a little short right now. If we could come to each other and knew that, not that they would be abused, not encouraging abuse of this whole system, but if we knew that if I really did have a need and I really was in short and I really did, and I could come to my church body and they're going to help me meet that need, overcome that obstacle, man, the community would be so tight. It'd be so connected. But that's, the point is, to not, you know, Stealing is the bad end, but the ideal in God's eyes is not just to be storehousing it, not to just build up our nest egg, but to be generous and to be giving, to have an open hand when God calls us to give. And we are called to be generous because we can't take any of it with us anyways. We leave it all behind. We got to store up treasures in heaven. And part of that is being generous with what God has entrusted with us on earth. Dave Ramsey says this about um, finances, and I love this quote. If you've heard, if you know this, um, you can help me fill in the blanks. If you don't know this, that's okay. You're going to know it real quick. Blank like no one else, so you can blank like no one else. What do you think the first one is? If you know it, say it. It says live like no one else. Live like no one else, so you can give like no one else. So live, and what he's saying is cut back on the extra things, cut back on the, the, um, the little pleasures, cut back on this stuff, because ultimately our goal is to be able to give and be generous. Live like no one else, so you can give like no one else. Verse 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as, is, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Now this, I think, 
Paul's looking at the guys when he writes this. Guys, like we, we like to get our little jabs in there. <laughs> you know, we like, to, we like to pick at each other, and we, we do it all in fun, right? I, I was reflecting on how when Darren and I go golfing, there's two games we actually play. We play golf, and we play head games, and you have to win both. If you lose the head games, you might as well walk off the course. Like, it's just, it's, and, but, and it's all in fun. It's all, you know, nobody's offended after it's all done. But it's not always the most uplifting time either with the head games. It's a little bit of a, you know, cut at the knees here and sucker punch. That. Anyways, guys, we get this, right? We like to just take the jabs. We do it all in fun. But Paul is saying, no, even in fun, because I've been, on just, I've been on the receiving end of a light jab on the wrong day. And that just cut so deep, and it hurt, and there's no ill intent, there's, no, there's nothing. But it hurt. It didn't change the fact that it hurt. It didn't change the fact that I was offended and angry, and it just disrupted the whole day. So Paul says, you know what? Even that stuff that's in jest, even that stuff that's for fun, just cut it all out. No corrupting talk. No, um, <laughs> but only that which is encouraging. Only that, and even Paul says, there's going to be times, you know, we got to we gotta course correct our friends, right? We got to come alongside and be like, yo, we got to cut that out, right? There's those times of correction that come, and sometimes they don't always feel like they're building up, but they should be. They should feel like encouragement, like, you know, you just make this course correction, things are going to go better for you. So he says, get rid of that corrupting talk, get rid of the, and it looks different for all of us, but he says, make sure that the primary thing that's coming out of our mouth is encouragement, is building up the body, building up the fellow believer. <clears throat> Anyways. And finally he says in verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Paul is saying that when you get, surrender your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells with you right away. It is there. He's dwelling within us. He is speaking to our life. He is the superpowered conscience, if you will. He leads and he guides and he speaks. But he is not some directionless substance that just kind of shows up and like, ah, he is a person. He can be, he has personality. He has a voice and he can be grieved. And one of the major roles the Holy Spirit has in our life is he is our advocate. And at some point, we're going to stand before God, we're going to give an account, and the Holy Spirit is going to advocate for us. Because Paul also says that nobody knows the thoughts of a person like his spirit does. So why would we want to grieve our advocate? Why would we want to grieve the one who has been given to us to encourage us, to empower us to do the impossible, to do the things that God has called us to do? He says, us, just don't do it. He's there. He's your helper. He's your teacher. Don't grieve him. Make him happy. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. The seal of your redemption. The last two verses, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. And this is back to that where we started, right? We don't, or back to that verse 26 about not being angry. Be tender-hearted. Be quick to forgive. Just as God has forgiven you and God has forgiven the person who has hurt you, you need to forgive the person. You need to let the grace of God overflow you and not let that unforgiveness and that bitterness. And the reason I feel that all this is so well-timed is that all that Paul is saying, I think we can all agree this is all good, right? The idea of being honest with each other all the time, building one another up, um, being generous. These are all things that we attain to and strive, but they are so completely countercultural especially in today's day. And we bring in the other four parts of the series, right? Unity is so countercultural in a day where we're so divided. The church is divided. The people are divided. Our communities are divided. There's so much division. We need to be the light of unity. People want to be unified. They don't want to fight. They don't want to be at odds with everybody. They want to find a spot where they belong and unity reigns supreme. They want... <clears throat> 
a community that is committed to seeing one another grow in a day where we are so, we would rather, not we, so many people would rather see you fall so they could climb up the ladder instead of working to climb the ladder themselves. We as a body are committed to seeing one another grow in maturity, grow into everything that God has called us to be. We are in this together. In a day when there's so much sin, so much corruption, so much bondage, so much thing pulling people down, and we say we are a community of freedom, that in God's spirit we are free from all of that, we're free from corruption, we're free from sin, we're free from, we're free from it all. Why? Wh- who wouldn't want to be a part of that? Who wouldn't want to come and find the freedom in Christ? Who wouldn't want to come and be like, experience that for the first time? We're not angry. We're encouraging one another. We're, we're, we're generous. If the church became identified by these things, if we become identified by them individually, then people are going to be attracted to us. But if we as a church are, are identified by these things and we embody them in our totality, we embody them day in and day out, and people look at us, they know who we're about because of what we're about there's going to be an excitement. There's going to be a, there's going to be an attractiveness. Somebody went, somebody said it a little while ago that the church has lost its attractiveness. The church has lost. People don't want to, it's hard to invite people in because the church isn't attractive anymore. If we took on all of the stuff that Ephesians 4 is talking about, I think we'd start being attractive again. I think we would want, we would want to invite people. We would want people to be a part of what's going on because it is so much good and it is so different from what you're seeing outside of these walls but we look at that list and we look at the things that god has called us to be and we're like "Ooh, that's a hard list that's a lot of things we got to do which is why we bring it back to what the the title of the series in the spirit we're not called to be generous on our own we're not called to be uplifting all the time on our own we're not even called to be honest by ourselves on our own we are called to be honest by god's empowerment we are called to be generous by god's provision we are called to be these exceptional set apart people by that seal by that spirit that rests on us we can't do it if we could have done it we wouldn't need the spirit jesus knew we needed help to do it so he sent us the spirit to rest and dwell within us to give us every opportunity and so we need to be conscious every single day to pause and invite the holy spirit into our day invite the holy spirit into our lives invite the holy spirit to come and give us the grace and the strength and the wisdom to be all the things that paul has called us to be through ephesians 4 on our own impossible i will say that it probably is impossible but with god's help anything is possible So may we, as one church, be a people who are constantly in the Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for your word. I thank you, God, that you have called us to be different. We called us to be set apart, to do things that nobody else is doing by your power. And so, Holy Spirit, we invite, I invite you into this place. I invite you into every building that is hearing my voice right now, that you would come and you would speak to every heart, you would fill every mind. Holy Spirit, come upon us and give us everything, the tools we need to be the people, to be the disciples you've called us to be, to be the church that you have called us to be. God, that we would embody all of these things, generosity, uplifting, honest all the time, unified, mature, free, and empowered. Holy Spirit, come. I pray, God, for your transformation in each and every one of our hearts, that we would not walk out of here unchanged, but that we would make that time for you to speak into our lives each and every day. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I pray we represent you well in all that we do. In Jesus' name I pray.
Amen.